And we hate to start off on a down note, but um, obviously everybody has just heard, we're just hearing the the news about Bruno Sammartino. And I just mentioned before we brought you on the show that, that you would have some memories because a lot of us in the Midwest, the way that we had gotten to see Bruno actually in person was when he worked for Bruiser in the uh, the war they had uh, in Indianapolis and Detroit with the Sheik and and he was one of the only promoters Bruiser that Bruno worked for that two years that he took off from the from the grind of the WWF championship. Well, before that, uh, Bruno really did work for Big Time Wrestling and the Sheik. Before that, uh, I remember meeting him. First. I forgot I, how I forgot how old you were. Truthfully, uh, also, there's that sixty three <laughs> this year. <laughs> But the first time I met Bruno, uh, he came into Detroit to work for the Sheik, and Georgianne Orsi, who I know her as, I can't pronounce her last name, Macalopolis or whatever, you know. Macropolis, Macropolis. But there George, you go. George, George, Georgie to everybody in, in longtime wrestling fandom. Right. Uh, and what a sweetheart of a gal. But she flew into Detroit, and I picked her up, her and Bruno at the airport, and, you know, the, he wrestled for the Sheik on the cars and, you know, no big deal. And I wasn't even the Sheik's photographer back then. I was just a fan. And after the show, I took them. Bruno wanted to go for Chinese food. So I took them to a little Chinese food uh, place that was only like, you know, half a mile from, you know, uh, Kobo Arena. And every time Bruno would come in, hence, you know, for the Sheik after that, you know, uh, that's when I was the Sheik's photographer. And, you know, good to see Bruno. And what a sight, such a nice man he was to everybody. And every time he'd come in for the Sheik, me and him would always go and have Chinese after the show. And then one time, we, the very last time he worked for the Sheik, uh, Bruno said to me over dinner that, you know, he's booked again against the Sheik in two weeks and don't say anything, but I ain't coming in. And it's like, oh, geez, what's this all about? And over dinner, he had happened to explain that the Sheik shorted him on a payoff. <laughs> he promised him $2,000 and only gave him 800 so oh my says, God! You know, so he says, "Keep it under your hat. I'm not going to be here." And he didn't show up. And hen- you know what happened was is that uh, you know they, they announced it to the crowd. Bruno, you know, uh, was stuck on you know his airplane or something like that. And then Louis Martinez, you know, comes rushing into the arena, you know, dressed in his street clothes and a suitcase in his hand, and runs into the ring and said, you know, hey, you know, Bruno couldn't make it, but I heard, and he called me, and I rushed here. <laughs> You know, he ran into the ring, and him and the Sheik went an hour Broadway. Oh, good so, Lord. The, well, yeah. They wanted to punish the fans even further? Oh, no. It was a great bout. It, it, was, it, it was really good. I don't know. whether. Well, in, in those days, I guess I can see Luis Martinez going an hour. Mm-hmm. But, uh, um, but, but right was, after that, you know, it wasn't too long after that that, you know, when the Bruiser came in uh, running opposition to the Sheik, uh, I, I'd say about it maybe a year later that uh, Bruno ended up coming in for Bruiser and had, you know, many great bouts with, uh, you know, Heenan and the Blackjacks and uh, Baron Von Roschke and, you know, but Bruno wasn't really a big draw here. You know, uh, he was more, you know, East Coast, a New York thing. And when he came in here, he really didn't have a name. So really the only fans that really knew him were the ones who collected like wrestling review wrestling you know world wrestling monthly you know the fans that read the magazines and the fan scenes from back in the day uh he wasn't promoted on tv at all he was just a name that came in and the fans sort of just didn't get him well you know and i was mentioning to brian earlier that at that point in time, like it was the magazines because it was too early for videotape. And when you think about it, since then, Bruno's had more of an impact because think how many people, as we said, moved from the Northeast, Boston and New York and Philadelphia and all those places between like the 60s and the 80s. Bruno may have been more of a household name after he retired in a lot of those places than he was when he was actually in the business because of the regional territories. Yep. But if you were a dedicated wrestling fan, obviously you knew who he was. And it was, it was, I've always wondered why 
what started the ill will with Bruno and the Sheik that led to Bruno. But Bruno and Bruiser had 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 a pretty good relationship too, I, I guess, didn't they? Because elsewise, Bruno wouldn't have worked for that many people. Yeah, and like I said, the, the breakup of the Sheik and Bruno was the you know shorting on the payoff at the one Kobo uh-huh. show. And, you know, he goes to the bruiser and, you know, you know, usually the, you know, big time wrestling shows and the bruiser shows, you know, that would run on consecutive nights, same nights, you know. So, you know, Kobo was bringing in major talent from all over the NWA that, you know, Sam Muchnick was sending in guys from like Eddie Graham and Cyclone Negro and uh, Gorilla Monsoon and just everybody was coming in on the Kobo shows. And, I mean, they were great matches, uh, but the same thing. The fans had no idea who these guys were. Well, you know, and, Unless, and unless you were a dedicated th- wrestling fan and knew them from the magazines. With Bruiser, I think he was almost smarter the time he spent in Detroit because – his cards were smaller. He had his territory stars, the Black Jacks and Heenan and Von Raschke and Ladd and, and uh, um, you know, the, uh, uh, Bob Ellis and uh, Sailor Art Thomas. But the yep. cards were smaller. Sheik was flying guys in from everywhere, having 12, 14 matches on a card. And eventually Sheik ended up with the same thing he had to begin with, Detroit. But all Bruiser did was pull back out of Detroit and go back to where he had started to begin with. It 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 really kind of that war burnt both territories out because they were the, never the same after they reconciled and Bruiser and Sheik had their matches. But the, either territory was never that hot again. No, that was the beginning of the end. They, uh, they somebody after, tweeted the clipping here not long ago where the Kobo sold out with twelve thousand and the Olympia had like nine or ten on the same night. That was like one of the very first shows that they butted heads together. Uh, after that, the Sheik was drawing consistently. I'd say nine to twelve thousand. Bruiser was doing two to four if he was lucky. Yeah. And was that once or twice a month? That was twice a month in those days, right? Twice a month, and uh, boy, there was uh, weeks on end that the Sheik was running every week. You know, either he was running, you know, Kobo Arena, or if he couldn't get the arena because maybe, you know, a Stars on Ice or a concert or something like that was booked in there, he would go to the state fairgrounds, or he would go to, you know, Kobo Hall, you know, right next door, you know, which was a one level thing and not arena. So it's like, you know, that was pretty bad. You'd get uh, seven, you know, five to seven thousand, you know, people there, but they were all sitting on, you know, floor seats, you know, yeah. there was no risers <laughs> or anything. So everybody sort of complained about that, but hey, they still drew and they still made money. But that that's insane. Detroit was selling several hundred thousand wrestling tickets a year. Uh, yep. f- for all those events and uh, you know for a, a period of a couple of years they were especially hot but at any rate and then of course Sheik the, the 60s run was incredible but but, uh, but Bruno um, I think it, it, he will go down and we can put a, a period on this and, and return to happier thoughts but Bruno is going to go down not only as one of the biggest box office attractions in the history of the business but he's also one of those rare guys that didn't really have to make a move. You know, I've always, I've always loved those guys, Lawler in Memphis or Vern Gagne in Minneapolis or uh, Bruno in, in, in really in the Northeast, they could get over and stay over and have legendary careers without having to, to do the, you know, the, the road thing for years and years and never have a, a home base. And in this, yeah, business, those, that, that was those, even more remarkable. Those were the luckiest guys in the business. Yeah. But on a final note on the Bruno thing, you know, from a few things that I've seen online and stuff already, God rest his soul and stuff like that. But I hated already that the WWE is putting things out there like they made him and, you know, Vince <laughs> McMahon Sr. was, you know, the saving. He made Bruno San Martino. But there is no mention in there about Vince McMahon Sr. when he blackballed Bruno back in the early 60s. Yeah, and and actually, and Bruno talked about that on the the straight shooting series interview that I did with him. We were talking about early in the program because uh, basically he got heat somehow, 
and uh, and and had to go to Toronto and work for Frank Tunney, where he was over, especially with the Italian audience there. But he had the, as the young Italian strongman, and he was doing such great business in Toronto that finally Vince Senior had to break down and bring him back when he needed a guy for the Garden. Yep. And uh, that was kind of sweet. And after that, it, you know, they they worked together, but it was always a little more strained in business after that. Oh yes, 